Bye, Val. All right. Hi, everyone. Great to see you. Welcome to our webinar today. My name is Marina Amini. I'm the executive director for the CVC, and um, we are so happy to have you for an hour of your time to talk about the Student Support Hub. So I just want to take a quick moment and tell you a little bit about our presenters and uh, kind of give you a bit of background about them. And there's our slide. Um, I was saying earlier, they really don't need any kind of introduction because um, these are folks that we all work well with and we recognize, but um, you know, they're going to tell us a little bit about the student support hub principles and the concepts of what it is. I just wanna, before I introduce them, say that I myself have learned from each of these people um, and their examples of the student support hub at, at their institutions, both in my current role and in my previous role as a dean at another college. So, um, you know, these are truly like the experts on the student support hub that I have turned to myself. And so I'm really grateful to have them. Uh, Jim Julius is one of our presenters. He's the faculty coordinator. He has been the faculty coordinator for online education at Miracosta College since 2011. And um, he has also just been a longstanding member of our DE community. He currently also serves as Miracosta's Academic Senate Coordinating Officer, ASCCC OERI Liaison, and Faculty ZTC Pathway Grant Coordinator. He loves soccer and native plants. You could talk to him about that. <laughs> and then Angela uh, Cardinal is our faculty member from Chafee College. She has been in online education since 2018 and is an English professor since 2005 at Chafee. Um, she has also done extensive work in professional development, online teaching, digital equity and uh, innovation hub, and uh, has recently published work in the LA Times as well. And then finally, Lene Whitney Putz from my own um, district at FHDA, Foothill De Anza Co uh, Community College District. She has her PhD in rhetoric. She is serving as the Dean of Online Learning at Foothill College and has previously led professional development here with the, the At One team. So really excited to have the three of them on board. Just a quick reminder that at about 30 minutes in, I'll be dropping a link for a feedback survey for this webinar. Please take a moment to complete that and tell us how we can improve future webinars and other topics of interest. And then um, we do not offer a badge or anything for this webinar. So if you need some kind of verification that you attended, what you can do is click the box to get a copy of that survey sent to you. And that can serve as your verification. Or if you forget to do that, send us an email at support at cvc.edu and we're happy to help out. So with that, I will hand it over to our facilitators and thank you very much. All right. Well, thanks Marina, Marina and thank you, uh, Valerie, for facilitating for us. And um, if you have not yet introduced yourself in the chat, please feel free to, to open the chat, introduce yourself, let us know um, what your role is as well, because we're, we're just curious to know um, what your interest and, and where you're coming from um, today. And please feel free to add questions and comments and thoughts and suggestions and links throughout the session in the chat. Keep it lively. There's three of us who are presenting as well as our facilitators, so we can definitely be responsive there. So just to make sure you understand, this is a, a two-part series. This is part one, introduction, and we'll do in two weeks from today, a second webinar, a follow-up, where we'll dig a little bit deeper on maintaining robust access to services through the Student Support Hub. We are also, in addition to the feedback survey that Marina mentioned, we're gonna share with you by the end, a survey link um, to help us gather more information about the status of Student Support Hubs across the community colleges in California. And that also will inform some of the things that we may address in that second webinar. So just to step back a little bit with a timeline, um, in, in 2017 at the online teaching conference, I co-presented a session with Dave Dillon from Grossmont College called Integrating Student Support Services into Online Teaching and Learning. It was kind of like a, a wish list, a, a, a what if, kind of an imagining um, of what this might be. And at that same OTC, some cool folks from the OEI, Jessica Hurtado, Bonnie Peters, and Marilyn Harvey presented a session called Designing Your Online Student Services Support Centers. And they also were kind of putting something out to the universe, like hoping to, to find a partner. And um, so I jumped on board and I said, let us at Miracosta be your um, partner in designing this. So throughout 2018, uh, while I was meeting with those three great folks, plus Arnita Porter, shout out to her as well, um, regular meetings, just 
visualizing, designing, like thinking of language, coming up with ideas. I also had a great partner at MiraCosta, um, Adrian Askernes, who's a counseling, an academic counselor. And he was um, on the MiraCosta end really working with me on laying the groundwork with other student service and support areas, um, just talking this up, meeting, trying to help people give us ideas as well as um, getting them ready for when we would launch to have a presence in what our initial student support hub might be. So at the end of 2018 and into 2019, um, there was a design that um, the, the OEI had contracted with a designer to kind of mock some things up. And our local online instructional technologist at MiraCosta took that, translated it into Canvas, and um, worked with our service areas to get all the tools and everything that they needed to work within Canvas up and running. And we deployed that hub um, by uh, April of 2019. And Chafee and Foothill have followed from there. So I want to throw back a couple slides because I did a couple of presentations back in 2019 and 2020 with CBC, and I still had access to some of those slides. This is one from back in that in that time period of emphasizing that idea of an online ecosystem that, that the OEI used to talk a lot about, that it's not just about access to quality online courses, but also those online support services. And the idea of the Student Support Hub was a key idea within um, that idea of an online ecosystem supporting our goal of increasing student completions. So this was another slide from Bonnie Peters, I believe. And again, just emphasizing the holistic approach, the equitable approach, and also this idea of synchronous connection to outside the classroom support, that the idea here was really being able to connect people online, live to other people for support with as little friction as possible. Um, so we came up with some principles that informed the design of our hubs. And we were really, um, I think that the, the folks from the OEI were bringing the idea that, you know, we have websites, of course, and there's things that we already have in place. We have some online tutoring, we have some online counseling, um, but we don't necessarily have it in a way that makes it easy for students to access those things. So uh, Bonnie Peters used to talk about like an app experience, trying to make it just like opening an app on your phone and making it as easy as that. These were some of the principles that we derived, that we wanted a hub to be very action oriented, that it's not about having a lot of information as many of our college website pages typically do, but getting right to a real person, real service, real time. We want minimal clicks, minimal scrolling, that streamlined design that allows users with the minimum effort to get right to where they're getting the support they need. Ideally, there would be a consistent experience across different services that the navigation and tools would be as similar as possible. And we always were focused on equity and, and what those equitable principles of design in terms of having inclusive language, in a language that's very easy to parse through as opposed, again, to many websites which appear with lots of text. Um, images should be inclusive and ideally the text should be mobile friendly as well. So let me jump into um, some examples specifically from my college, MiraCosta, and give you a little bit of a tour. So first of all, um, like many uh, of our student support hubs that have been deployed and, and at MiraCosta, we were the first, um, it's in Canvas and we've added this student support button to our global navigation. So you'll see that wherever you are, everybody sees that in Canvas. Um, and in 2019, when we first deployed the Student Support Hub, it looked something like this, with just these six services that were there. Um, we had the word online after each service. Um, I guess that was part of our transitional thinking. And here we are in 2024. We've got a number of additional services that are represented. Some of those added gradually over the years, and, and a, a many of them added when we went to our uh, transition to all online operation during COVID. But let me actually jump to the live um, to Student Support Hub in our Canvas and just demonstrate a little bit of why, um, why I think it's really valuable. And I'll contrast it with our website. So again, up at the top, we have these key academic support areas um, from the library and our different tutoring support areas. Then we have our student service and support areas. Our care team is basic needs, health services, academic counseling, career coaching. And then we have some tech support down at the bottom. I really like how the Writing Center is set up. So I'm gonna click that just for a moment and show you how the Writing Center, again, this orientation to action, 
um, titles that are really straightforward and just bulleted text underneath and some great options here. They can make a Zoom appointment. We also have a live online learning center where there may be a writing consultant available right at that time. The hours of operation are here. And as you can see, it goes into the into up till 10 o'clock, Monday through Thursday. It's also open on Sundays. And for students that are shy or don't want to do a live online um, uh, consulting session, we have an option to upload a paper for video feedback. And within 24 hours, they'll get a video back from one of our writing consultants. We also want to make sure that online students or students who are working online know that um, they're welcome to come on campus. And so the hours of, of our campus operations are here as well. So let's compare that for a moment to, um, to, the, to our MiraCosta website. So I'm going to just start at the top on the MiraCosta website. And if you're a student looking for help, I, there's a lot of options here where to even begin. This current students might catch your eye and that's actually not too bad. If you jump to current students, it gets you right to a place where with one more click, you are on a website for support, but there are a lot of links here. Um, can I zero in on what I want? If I go to the writing center, if I find that here under academic support, um, you'll see that the writing center website is actually pretty good. I like it because I just barely scroll down and here are those actions, those same exact actions that are in the student support hub are right here. Enter the live online drop-in center, upload for video feedback or make a Zoom appointment. And I will say that this website has been redesigned over the years, I think very much informed by the design principles that we brought into play um, in the student support hub. So I think um, that's one of the benefits of the student support hub that you design or that you're involved with is that you may not have a lot of influence on how your campus website works, but there can be some of those principles that are folded back in um, to your your um, your college website. So I just want to jump back to the um, to this page as well. So if you didn't click current students, there's another area here, academic support and tutoring. And again, I just wanna show you how this is kind of similar and informed by the design of the hub. And it, these are just good principles, but it just has these same tiles that you see in the hub, academic support. And, you know, they are different tutoring centers, different help desks. They, they're right here in that kind of tile format. Um, all right. So I wanna share with you a little bit of data. This data is from 2020. So some of you might remember that 2020 was a pretty, spring of 2020 was a pretty important time. But in the chat, I'd be curious to see what you pick out from these patterns. What do you notice? Um, what do you think some of the peaks represent? What do you think some of the valleys represent? Why is it higher over on this side than over on this side? If you have any thoughts about any of that, um, I'd be curious to, to see if it, people can intuit why this, um, why this looks the way it does. And remember at MiraCosta, we deployed this originally at the end of spring 2019. So it had been around for almost a year. Fall of 2020 was our first full semester with it in operation. People were starting to get to know about it a little bit and so on. Um, don't see anybody bold that's put anything in chat. Oh, there we go. At the beginning of the shelter in place, there are a few high peaks, exactly, Ying said. So, um, right, this middle part of the semester where there's a several days in a row that are down, that's spring break. And we had announced before spring break that we were gonna take an extra week and then reopen in all online operation due to COVID, right? That was that, was that March. And so um, I'm a little surprised actually that that week following spring break where we were, were not yet in operation, but as a college, we were preparing to, to restart. That got pretty high again, but there's the first day post COVID. It's really big. Honestly, I can't explain why this day that's like two weeks later is, is so high. I don't know what was special about that day, um, but this is all post online only operation in COVID. Back at the beginning of the semester, you can see the first days of the semester um, right there. So those days always have that, that peak. So here we are last fall. So compare um, spring 2020 with fall 2023. So first thing you'll notice, our highest peaks here were, over, were up in the 6,000 range. And, you know, pre-COVID, most of this is hovering around 1,000. And post, you know, once we're in online operation, it's, it's just above or below 2,000, a little bit higher even toward the end of the semester. Um, but here in fall 2023, we peak on day one of the semester at 8,000. 
And that 2000 is pretty much where we are, but you can still see that pattern with weekend days, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, tending to fall down a little bit. I don't know why this one week in October was so low. We don't have a, a week closure in October. That's a little unusual. And then of course you can see it. Here's like the last day of finals and then it just falls off pretty quick. So I thought you might be interested to see the data laid out like this, where it's comparing days of the week. Pre-COVID 2020, all online operations, spring 2020, and now here in fall 2023. So uh, you can see that we have these huge um, jumps from you know before COVID kicked in to all online operation. But here we are in fall 2023, still with probably slightly less enrollment than we were here, but it's like double on the Mondays. Um, and quite a bit, almost double on the weekends too, which I think is really interesting that our weekend has almost, it, it's at or, or even above on Sundays what we were back during all online operation. And I think that's because as students have gotten more and more familiar with this, they know that they can access things like online tutoring on Sundays and they'll, they'll hit the hub um, to access it through that. So um, yeah, so I wanna just say a few words about some of the strengths that I think MiraCosta brings to the work with the hub and, and that have helped us to be as successful as we've been. One is that we have this longstanding emphasis on the support of online, of online support for all students. So we never saw the hub as a thing that needed to be created like to fulfill accreditation requirements of you know, uh, comparable services for DE students. No, we, we understand, and I think all of our service areas understand the more we can do online, the more we're better serving all of our students. So many of our students, even if they're coming to campus, they're not able to hang around. They've got busy lives they're jetting off to, they're not getting to the work until the evenings and the weekends. And if we can meet them where they are online, you know, that was one of the things that Bonnie Peters used to always say, meeting them where they are, meeting, where, meeting them where they are. That's a way of doing it for all of our students. We had some early adopters, some pilot folks in our counseling areas, in our library area. They really helped establish the vision for this. They helped advocate with other support areas. It wasn't just me doing that work. They helped pilot different technologies and try things out along the way. And MiraCosta has not retreated from that expansion that I mentioned at the beginning of COVID. Most of our online tutoring was provided through external tutoring um, services. We have NetTutor through OEI. We also joined um, the Western e-tutoring consortium back in 2012 to provide online tutoring. But when um, when COVID kicked in, all of our uh, service areas in our tutoring centers went online fully and they have not retreated from that. They've recognized how important it is to our students to have local tutors they have relationships with, um, they trust, they understand and work with really well. So we've continued to, to offer all of that um, just as much as we were uh, two years ago. Again, I mentioned our, our really capable online instructional technologist, Karen Turpin. She developed the hub. She's really the primary technical main, maintenance person on the hub. She worked with the OEI on creating that shell that's gone into Canvas Commons, which hopefully you're aware of, maybe you've, you've used um, to launch or to, to begin designing your hub. And the, the last thing I'll mention is that, you know, it's, it's a challenge for all of us to have our students aware of things like our hubs and the services available there. One thing that we have at MiraCosta is an online readiness workshop. I, I'm privileged to provide those. And we have really strong student participation. Um, we have somewhere between 1,200 to 1,500 students every semester that participate in those with me. And... Um, and this is one of the things I do at the end, just show them how to access the hub, what those things look like in the hub. We have a librarian that jumps in and shows how the library services and librarian chat works in the hub. So I think that's that's a really important way that we help more and more students get to know it. In terms of challenges, um, and this is the kind of thing that we're really gonna dig in even more deeply on our second webinar, but I think um, clarity on the responsibilities and processes for adding, maintaining, and updating services. It's always a little tricky, partly because one thing that's so cool about the hub is it, it it's such a cross-functional um, place that requires collaboration across instructional, academic support areas, student service support areas, technology, and, um, and online education or distance education. And um, so sometimes it's it can be challenging to know who's responsible for what. 
Um, how do we recruit new services? How do we make sure that what they um, think they're getting into really is what they're doing? What if they propose doing something that doesn't quite fit with the principles? You know, all of those can be challenging. The consistency across the services within the hub um, has always been a challenge. We had Cranium Cafe for a while. Others were using Zoom. There might be other tools at play as well. And although over time we have gotten, I think, away from Cranium Cafe into Zoom, that, that continues to be, I think, something we can work on. And there was a very abrupt transition for us. Even after um, the state stopped funding Cranium Cafe, we continued to pay for it for a couple of years. But one of these clarity issues was like, how do we decide when we don't do that anymore? How do we help make sure that everybody's ready when we decide that we're not paying for that anymore? And honestly, that didn't really happen for us. It was just sort of dropped at the end of the fiscal year. And there were a lot of services that were like, ah, what do we do? So that illustrates, I think, some of that challenge. And, and again, still a feeling that it could be a little bit better promoted um, is one of those things that I think we all um, we all probably would, would like to be able to, to feel more comfortable with. Um, Ying, I see you raise your hand. Yeah, thanks, Jim. Uh, that's a wonderful demo of your uh, student support hub. Um, so I I guess my question is in the strengths and also early on when you were showing the data table, um, you're talking about, so during the pandemic, uh, students using the hub increased pretty dramatically. And then after pandemic, now in you know, fall 23, um, you still have a lot more students using the support hub than pre-pandemic, right? So I was just wondering, and then, you know, you also mentioned that enrollment is actually a little bit down uh, than pre-pandemic. So that means the percentage of students using the hub is actually pretty, pretty high or higher, a lot higher than COVID. Um, does that mean the promotion or the promotion of the hub or students are just more aware of the hub's existence? Yeah, it's hard to really know how to attribute it. I think it's just time that, you know, over time, more and more students have have become aware of it. More faculty are aware of it. I actually have some faculty that like to attend this the online orientation that I do for students, and they become more aware of accessing these services. They're more likely to integrate it, promote it to students. We've done workshops for faculty over time as well about it, about the hub, about the online services, about integrating it more and more into their classes for their students and promoting it. It's actually written into our, um, our online requirements, our AP 4105, that faculty are supposed to um, promote the online services of the college to their students in distance education classes. So all of those things I think have contributed, yeah, over time. And thanks for that answer. And then, so your last bullet point here right now is, uh, it could be better promoted. So what are some ideas about better yeah. promoting? Yeah. Well, so I don't want to take up too much more time. This is a good question. And that's really, I think, where we want to dig in deeper in our second um, webinar. So it's a great question and, and one that we'll get into more. But I want to turn it over to my um, colleagues who are co-presenting to, to give us a taste of some of what they're doing. So with that, um, I'll turn it over to Angela at Chafee. And Angela, do you want me to keep displaying the slides for you and then sure. Uh, Share yeah, or, that'd be yeah. great. Okay, we'll do. Thank you. Um, I just also want to first thank um, Jim and Marina because when I was new in this position, I relied on them a lot, and so we even did a field trip where we visited <laughs> their colleges and car. Like we drove down there um, to get ideas, and so and one of the the big ones was the student support hub. So I'm not even going to show a before slide of our student support hub because it basically looked just like Miracosas. <laughs> so. <laughs> Um, so this is the current iteration of it, um, and we have um, it also embedded into the course menu there with just a different logo, and this is just a snapshot of what we have. Um, actually, I should probably share the live, so maybe I'll just um, share my screen next. Um, so this is our live hub. Do you all see it? Yes. Okay. And so you can see that, yeah, it, you know, we have... Uh, a lot more than we had originally, uh, which was, it was similar to Maricosta's. Uh, I will just, uh, let's see, let me go into the libraries. And you can see there's a 24 seven chat there. And then you can even meet individually with librarians um, here. Mm -hmm. 
we did add some, we get a lot of questions about technical support. So even though um, these are not sort of live meeting, there might be just a phone number. We did include that here because it's sort of a one-stop shop where students can get the support they need right away. So we did have to loosen up some of those principles, but very, we're still pretty strict about it. So you can see, you know, when we go to help desks, we have the information for distance ed and we have the information for ITS and kind of a brief thing about what those provide. Um, let's see here. And yeah, so I'll just go ahead and, and move on from there back to the slideshow. So I will stop sharing and let Jim share again. Thank you. So we can go to the next slide. So I have just some quick data. I know that's very small, but you can see, so we were really lucky in Launch Stars in January, 2020. We had to work, it was really essential to bring people from counseling and library and um, tutoring down to Miracosta to meet with their counterpart, because at that time it was very um, dicey to try to do all this stuff online. And so to meet with the counterparts and sort of have a counselor talk to a counselor about concerns they had about doing online counseling was really crucial. And I highly recommend that you work with other models or other, you know, kind of putting people in touch with each other so that they're not thinking you're just an English professor coming and telling them how to do their job. That is not very effective. Um, and I learned that very quickly. So we were able to get some people to pilot this earlier on. Um, so we, in January, the counseling was just about to pull out of the hub because there were some differences of opinion. And then luckily, the one good thing that came from the pandemic is that now all every counseling area is online and they've expanded. So that's been really good. But we launched in January, 2020. And then you could see the huge spike, uh, like 250 page views uh, right around here. Um, and then we've, let's see, we have in September, 22. So at the, again, at the beginning of the term, we get some spikes, um, but it's kind of uneven. And we don't quite know exactly why, just kind of like what Jim was saying, but we have some speculation about it. Um, we just did a spring 22 survey um, and then a fall 2023 survey to see where students knew where to access things. And although there's room to improve, I think that these are pretty good numbers. And I'll show you on our next slide. Um, let me see here. Um, yeah, so I'll, well, I'll show you in the, in the next slide after this, what we had, where we had a, an issue. Um, so some of our strengths, we've added items to the support hub based on feedback. So we do regular needs assessments of students to see where there might be gaps. And then we use that to kind of guide our work. And so in 2022, there was room to improve. So we do, we added financial aid and technical support, and we added messaging to students to try to direct them there. Um, we do now use impact messaging, which we highly recommend. And we use that to kind of target uh, messages based on feedback from students. It really was helpful in fall of 2022, the Academic Senate recommended and added to their syllabus checklist that the Student Support Hub be a central place faculty point students to for support services. So getting faculty to connect their students there is really crucial. Um, in summer of 2023, admissions and records updated their welcome package to include the Student Support Hub as an action step. So that's really helpful as well. We did have, we do have here, 43% um, of students stated that they do not know about online mental health care resources. So that's still a gap. Um, but based on their feedback, we created this direct student response. Um, let me see, I can share. So that's here. And that just sort of, sort of shows students, you know, we do this via impact. So based on their the needs assessment, we can then communicate with them like, hey, you know, hey, it looks like there's a gap in where to access these things and we connect them with those resources and some of that includes the Student Support Hub. So, okay. Sorry, Jim, if you wouldn't mind going back to the slideshow. And then we can go to the next slide. Um, so challenges, we still need a consistent workflow for establishing and updating point people. As Jim mentioned, the great thing about it is we're working cross-functionally. The challenging thing is that we're working cross-functionally and there's been a lot of change at our institution in the last se several years. And so that always, you know, is represent presents a challenge to us. And then, yes, people have different ideas about what this looks like. And so we have to, you know, remind them of the principles, remind them about user experience and, you know, without being, we're, we're working laterally. So me rolling up into the tutoring centers and saying things doesn't always go over great. And so we always have to kind of be mindful about how to shape those conversations. Um, and then how to identify point people and create a consistent workflow for um, doing updates. 
Uh, we need to clear out our moments. And so I just, um, two team members here, Adriana and Rihanna, they're the ones that do all the actual technical work here and, and uh, are huge um, proponents of the hub. Adriana and I tracked Jessica and Bonnie down after that OTC presentation in the hallway and got that information from them. So they are kind of the crucial members of the team here. And they said there's 58,000 people enrolled in our hub right now. So we need to make a workflow for clearing that out because that's not how many students are actively using it. Um, and then we also need to intentionally rename files. We did a lot of this work in a hurry and, you know, under pressure. And so that way we can track our data more intentionally using Canvas analytics and impact. And then we need to promote and direct students to other resources within the hub. We have modules that have resources and then just to get them to use the hub the best way. I'd love to ask Jim how he gets that many students to come to the orientation. So, but we could talk offline about that. So I think that's my the main um, information that I wanted to present, but I'm happy to help anybody if you have more questions. So I don't know if there's questions in the chat. Um, I don't see, I, there There were questions from, oh, how do you stay current with the information on the Student Support Hub? Who's updating it? Well, <laughs> We, we, when there's a problem, then we fix it. And that's basically, I think, our main approach right now. I don't know if Adriana has anything to add there or Rhiannon. Yeah, just we do have a dedicated uh, support um, role that supports students directly. So she definitely helps with the upkeep, but it is part of our kind of one of the challenges of we then need to track down whoever's managing because there's been a lot of just shifts and changes. So if there's like a new person that oversees that area, just making sure that our contacts are all aligned to to ensure that um, everything updated is is accurate. But we, we've been trying to update at least at the beginning of a term and then review at the end of a term. So we do have support in the office for that. All right, thank you. All right, so we'll turn it over to Lene. Thanks, Jim. And I'll go ahead and share if that's okay, so I can Great. go back and forth. All right, so um, I just wanted to show you um, one of the uh, issues that we have, um, which is we have a really, really long um, set of items that is in our global navigation and our student support portal falls at the bottom of that. The only thing below it is, is pronto. And um, so as you're getting ready or thinking about your student support portal, um, be sure to view it in student view where it's going to rise up a little bit, but not if they're in groups or, or other things, right? And so that's just kind of like a little warning about how it might kind of drop below the fold, um, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, I too was at the OTC uh, presentation um, and was super inspired um, by what Miracosta was doing. And so I ran back to my campus and um, I sent out a message to uh, all of our student support services, um, especially like the library and counseling and mental health. And everybody was like, that's so cool. And then I gave them a form and I said, you know, please let me know right away if you would like to, um, to do this. And some really good advice that Jim had given me was like, target the areas where you can have students actually do an action where they can get to the service with just one or two clicks. Um, but also target the people who want to work with you. Otherwise, it will be incredibly difficult. And he also gave me some really good advice, like maybe start with three or four at the most, right? So I couldn't wait to find out who was going to be the three or four people who were going to help us shape this hub. And I waited and I waited. And then we had another meeting with student services and I put myself on the agenda and I said, you know, just as a reminder. And then I waited and nothing happened. And then um, we were getting, you know, to the end of 2019 by now. And so I started making individual appointments to go to people's offices and everyone was really interested, but no one wanted to tap someone on their team to do the work. And then um, 
you know, we had a few people that were working on what their content might be. And we had a mock-up going um, and we were ready to show it to people in like February of 2020. And then, you know, what happened in March. And so everything stopped working on this as far as the campus was concerned, but like we had our spidey senses up and we were like, we got to get the hub up and we have to like knock on more doors than just three or four. And one of the things that the campus was doing was creating this um, kind of gigantic resource for students on where things were going to be since we were remote. And unlike um, 113, well, wait, 112 of our campuses, we were in finals when the pandemic hit. And so we had like an emergency. Um, I mean, everyone did, but we had an emergency about how we were going to get these finals done and um, and registration completed for all of our students. And um, this gigantic, uh, huge piece of work that everyone was working on to go onto the website became more and more like a spider web. And we couldn't navigate it when we needed material. And I'm talking like pages and pages added every single day as they were trying to document how students would get to services. And so we said, you know, we can't control the website as Tim noted, but we can do really, really student-centered user-friendly things here. So our hub actually covers more than just the things that students can do in a click or two. Um, because it, it's like a mini website, the difference is that it is 100% student focused. And so we just like streamline exactly what the information is that students need to get moving. And so we might have a summary of some services, but then we have contact information. And whenever possible, we um, have just one click for them to get to the service. Um, let me move my Zoom bar. And I'll show you. For instance, um, this is our tutoring page. And um, one thing that is really difficult is keeping all of the information really, really current, uh, as anyone who has a hub will tell you. And one of the things that we did was design an interface so that um, our tutoring center can update this themselves on a daily basis. So if they have a reason to like close or extend hours or whatever, um, they actually go into a Google slide and it populates this page. Um, so it is always up to date. Our spring schedule um, started on Monday and here we are. This is already updated, um, which is a really, really great thing. We don't have to do anything for those particular pieces. And then when students scroll down, they have those buttons to actually meet with their tutor or schedule a drop-in appointment or whatever they need to do. So we have exactly the information students need without all of the external um, cognitive load of the website and that button that directs them to exactly what it is that they need. Um, and now I'm not a Google Slides person, so I lost my slides. Uh, yeah, there it is. Um, so, um, some of the strengths of doing it this way is that, um, you know, we had a lot of buy-in. It's the, the COVID silver lining, as Angela noted. And then um, we had a lot of department ownership then of those individual pieces. And what we did is we set up um, a smart sheet uh, process so people are just routinely reminded to check their hub and update any information. Some of them have the ability to update it themselves, and uh, but most of it, the online learning department updates because it is a lot of coding in um, back to make it uh, aesthetically pleasing. Um, and you know, one of the strengths we find is that uh, our website is is not necessarily student friendly. As a matter of fact. Um, it's embarrassing to admit, but we had a website redesign about five years ago. And if you search, you still get our old website. Um, so the, the archival website will show up in search results if you're in Google or something like that. And so students can actually get wildly inaccurate information. So we think that it's better than the website. 
And um, most importantly, that it's so streamlined that it leads directly to an action when appropriate, um, which is really nice for our students. Uh, it's also great that it's in Canvas. It lives where students are. And so as they're working on their classes, if they have a question, it's just right there on the, the navigation bar. And most importantly, unlike the website, we have a large online learning website with a student facing um, piece to it, uh, but we have to use the campus um, web uh, portal and uh, Canvas is our wheelhouse. And so we feel much more comfortable in Canvas, much more in control in Canvas. It's, it's where we would prefer to be designing. So we like that it's in our wheelhouse. Uh, but there are challenges too. Um, and sometimes the challenges are also, you know, part of the strengths. So though we have a process for staying current, some departments are better at it than others. We find our departments that serve a lot of students, they need that information to be current. And so they're proactive. They come to us and say, we changed our hours. Can you make sure that the student support portal is updated or we're extending our hours for uh, midterms or finals? Um, but uh, if there are new items, like new services that have been created over the past couple of years, it sometimes takes us quite a while to even know that those exist. And so those don't always make it into the uh, the portal, our support hub, um, as, as soon as we would like them to. Um, we also have, uh, we made a, a different choice. Uh, rather than enrolling our students, uh, because of our website issues, we wanted this to be public. We have a lot of dual enrollment students and, um, and other uh, people who might need information. And we actually think that this is an enrollment um, boost. And so ours is a public site. Um, we use uh, simple syllabus and we have a section of simple syllabus that is maintained uh, by our faculty and the student support portal is in there. So that means that students who are looking at our syllabus library can actually access the support hub in case they need it. Um, but it means that we can't use Canvas to track analytics or get student feedback via the hub or anything else. So all of those pieces have to be done in a different way. Um, I've even tried to work with Canvas to see if there's any way that we can get some kind of analytic on a public site. And the, the, you know, the answer is no. So the only reason we know that our um, student support portal is working is because students tell us it is. And that means you have to ask. Um, I said Canvas is a benefit. It's also a challenge. We can't change where the support hub is on the left-hand navigation. So that link is kind of below the fold. And if people are really zoomed in, they might not even see it. Uh, if they have groups and other things, faculty, students actually see it more than faculty do. Um, and so our faculty have said, like, I've been trying to, you know, send my students to the support hub, but I can't find it. And it's just that they didn't scroll down far enough. Um, interestingly, our faculty have asked over and over again for a faculty support hub. We do enroll them in a Canvas course, and that's what the support hub is. We think that we should just name our faculty handbook, the faculty support hub, and then put it on the, it's already on their dashboard, um, but they love that it's right there in the navigation. So go figure. Um, the other problem with it being in Canvas is that um, you have to do a lot to make it look pretty and you have to have someone to manage um, the the interface, um, you know, because Canvas is not a real website. It's only like a half a website. And so some of the things that we want to do in HTML, we just can't do. Um, so we're constantly kind of negotiating and navigating how to do that better. Uh, and I think that that is my, my last slide. Maybe I'll go back and see if we have um, any questions or maybe stop sharing and see if we have any questions. Dan. Hey, Lene. Whoops, there I am. Um, we're, we're thinking that most students and non-enrolled students would be interested in public-facing web pages since they couldn't get into Canvas. 
And so our student services and support uh, links duplicated. So you actually have two things to keep updated, uh, the Canvas hub and the public facing web pages. What you're thinking about that? Well, I'm not in charge of the public facing web pages. And so uh, <laughs> really like my task is to just make sure that we are uh, interfacing with anyone who has a support tile and making sure that our support hub is up to date. Um, but since most of the links actually take them to actions, things that students can do, um, they're pretty much up to date. We don't have a problem with broken links or linking to old or inaccurate information because it's so streamlined. I, I don't know if Angela and Jim have um, a difference in that. We have a similar frustration with our website and and lack of, you know, they, they don't, I don't, they don't ask me to the meetings to decide things. So um, this has been a great way to sort of streamline access to students because we're primarily concerned with the students having the support they need when they need it. I do think we influence, like Jim was saying, the website so that there are action-based items on the website that never existed. It used to just be paragraphs of text everywhere, but we also redesigned recently and we were not asked to join the conversation. I'm a huge advocate that we need campus-wide user experience training and, um, you know, sort of buy in campus wide with that. And that's, you know, I don't have that much power, but I do, you know, we have a little more power over the hub, so. Yeah, and so the only thing I'll share is that we do have, I, I didn't show this when I was um, showing the campus website because I was really wanting to show what other, you know, what the, the college as a whole has done that sort of kind of mirrors the hub, but there is an online education page that I can control and it's not elegant, but it just is a list of the same links. Um, and again, it's all website based instead of canvas based, but it's just another option. So th this is where I have control and this is the choice I've made is it's super texty, but it's, but it's also super, um, I think pretty organized and pretty easy for students to see what they want. Um, I will also say that Miracosta is about to start as I understand it, a whole new process of deciding how to design our website and maintain it. And I am invited to that conversation, so I'm glad, but I don't really know anything about it. <laughs> yeah, thanks. It's it's We run into it all the time of duplicate or different pages with having to have the same information. One is updated, the other is not, and it's uh, it's messy. Right, so we have a few more minutes for people that wanna ask other questions, have additional conversation, but let me just also share um, a wrap up slide with you all and a couple of important links. So um, there's links there on the page, but I will copy them and paste them into the chat as well um, for you. So first of all, we do have a survey that's different from the survey that Valerie keeps reminding you about. That's kind of a feedback survey on the webinar today. But we have a survey that we would really like as many folks to respond to as possible. I think I'll get it sent out to DE all as well um, to just kind of gather as much information about the state of student support hubs across the system. So if you have one, if you don't have one, if you have one that your college has started talking about, but you're not there yet, no matter what, we would like to hear from you. Um, so if you wouldn't mind um, filling that out, that would be very, very awesome. Um, and yeah, Melinda, the, so let me also just share with you the second thing, which helps get at your question, um, which is a resource page that we've set up. Um, and I know that CDC has its own resource pages where they post links to webinars, um, but um, this resource page that I just posted here, um, I'll open it as well, just so you can see what I'm talking about. It just has some information about this webinar series. Right now it has links to Zoom registration, but as soon as there's a link to the actual recording, we'll change that and it will have the recording. We're, we'll post the link to our slides, it has our presenter bios, and then it has resources. So Miracosta's, by the way, I didn't mention this during my presentation, but our um, Student Support Hub is a publicly available Canvas page. So anybody can go on it and look at it. If you wanna show it to other folks, you don't have to be enrolled to be able to pull it up. 
And if there are other public links that we gather through that survey, I'll add them here. So we have a, a quick and easy um, place to, uh, to visit as many examples as possible. And again, yeah, part of the survey also will just give us more of an idea of the kinds of things that we might want to talk about next time. As I mentioned, we definitely want to get into some of the more nitty gritty that we've already started talking about a little bit with challenges, with services, maintaining accurate information, consistent experiences, the tools that we're using, how all that integrates into Canvas. Um, I'm also really curious to know um, if there are colleges that have what they consider a student support hub that's not in Canvas. Um, and, and I would love to hear about any of those and have those as examples as well. Oh yeah, I'll, I will. I didn't put our contact information on that page, but I will. As soon as this is done, I'll add our um, our email addresses onto this page so folks have that from that uh, resource document. I also want to share. You know, this was like a really heavy lift to get the people to do this, like Lene was saying. So if you have strategies, if you, I mean, I think it's doable. Is what I'm saying. It wasn't like everyone was super excited about this idea originally, and so I think um, that might be something we look at for our next webinar. Is how do you practically move things forward in a bureaucracy? For sure. Ying, go ahead. Um. Actually, just tagging along with and what Angela just said, because all three of you mentioned it's totally a cross-functional team uh, that established the hub and also maintaining the hub. And there are just so many people on campus involved in this whole thing. And uh, Jim, I know you, you said that it's probably more of the focus of the next webinar. Um, but I'm just wondering if you, if people want to, you know, just talk about tips uh, a little bit. <laughs> Yeah, well, I'll read I mean, Lene was really good at reiterating the, some of the wisdom that I passed on to her that I might have already started to forget because it was a while ago. But, you know, I think with a lot of change initiatives at your college, it's it's not about worrying about the, to the big picture. It's about finding your one or two partners that are on board with you. So is that tutoring? Is that counseling? Is that library? But finding those kinds of folks that are really eager to to up their online presence and think with you about how to engage in that. Because once you get those folks that are excited about it and you create like a pilot site or something, then they are like ambassadors with areas that they might be even better connected to than you are. So I think um, that's that's a big part of the strategy for me is just trying to find that one or two that are that are you're they're willing to hook on to you and kind of be the face of of the project to their student services colleagues or to their instructional support services colleagues. When we did the initial um, outreach, um, I handed out index cards and I asked you know, each person to put their a service area at the top. And then I said, you know, what is um, the most important service that you're currently offering students that you wish they had easier access to? And I had them just like write a few minutes about that. And, and then I said, okay, if anybody's willing to, you know, participate in this, you know, we want to help you make that access. And so I asked for them to just like kind of name one person from their service area and put it on the card and I collected the cards. And so that gave me like my initial um, kind of like idea. And believe me, not all of the ideas were ones that were good for the hub. Um, like, you know, some of them were just not, not based for online students or not something, you know, that we would be doing in the hub, but it at least got me talking to someone. And I think that that really helped. My, my one tip before we end is just finding out why, like, what is your main point of resistance for each area and then solving that like solving it for, hey, I look good news. I solved your problem. It's doable. And here's some models and here's some people to talk to you. And that was really moving things forward because then they really couldn't say much, you know? So, and, uh, you know, and even some people I found weird grant money for and threw money at them. Like it was just all over the place. So there's lots of ways. Yeah. And I would just add, I think, um, you know, part of what I'm really curious about is how many colleges still don't have much of, in this regard. I don't know how you got through the pandemic without it. 
But if you did and you're here and now you want to do it, um, I feel like there probably are going to be colleagues in parallel who do that service at another institution who are in the hub, who would also be good people to connect with. So that might, I, I hadn't really thought of that before, but um, I think that could be a good strategy. Like, you know, if you have a tutoring person who's sort of skeptical, but I can connect you with the tutoring person from Maricosta and they can speak the same language with each other about it. And I, I know my colleagues at Maricosta, you know, whether it's a counseling or tutoring or librarians or whoever it might be, would be really happy. And in some cases that might get a kind of technical about the tools they chose or, you know, how the interface works from Canvas into the campus-based tools or whatever it might be, how they've set up Zoom to do their online tutoring. I mean, I don't know where those conversations need to go, but I know that my colleagues that are doing that stuff are probably going to be better than me at answering those kinds of questions. And, and so that's always an option too. Thank you. Um, so Dave, I think the answer, we're all using Canvas for it. No, I meant like what website content, the content management systems for your district websites. Oh. That seems to be one of the bigger problems that this is a result of, right? Uh, uh, that's what I'm hearing. <laughs> Yeah, we use Omni Update for oh. our website and we actually use a diffused model. So every department has an Omni Update person, um, but which I think can lead to um, better, more up-to-date information on your website um, because people don't have to wait for a central area to do it. But it also means that um, our web pages, like some of them have really student-centered language and some of them do not. Some of them, like they needed a technical writer and no one in the department is a technical writer. And so the, even the instructions, like, I mean, we're all in um, ed tech, right? Like when you write instructions, then you try it yourself first to see if you skipped a step or misrepresented a step and then you give it to someone who doesn't know how to do it and you ask them if they misrepresented a step, I can guarantee you the people who wrote the instructions on how to add or drop a class have never tried to, to do it because the instructions on our website are wildly inaccurate. So that's a problem. Do you only have like one webmaster or... No, each department has their own person who's trained in Omni Update, uh, okay. the department's responsibility. So you get wildly different writing styles. Gotcha. You want single voice editing. Totally. We only have one webmaster and we, all, we also have problems. I think <laughs> we still have a, an issue with um, our entire college. Like I would say the administration thinking that if it's digital, it's real. Like it's still an issue. And I don't know how that is still an issue after the pandemic, but that has resulted in really poor user experience that, you know, I we have two instructional designers on our team and we think in that way, but I don't think it's widely thought of that way. So I think people don't know what they don't know. So I'm, my dream is that we get a user experience audit campus-wide and use that to drive change, but I don't know how to make that happen. So one, maybe one day. So I'm going to just jump in. We have about a minute left. If you haven't taken our survey for your feedback for this webinar, please do so. Val will drop it in one last time. And then also Jim dropped a survey that's different. It's about, you know, kind of gathering information on your use of the Student Support Hub system-wide. So please just take a moment and help us to give us feedback on both of those surveys. A big thank you to Jim, Angela, and Lene. Lots of still good questions, I think, remaining. It's a great segue to remind you to show up on the 24th for the part two of this webinar series um, where you can kind of learn more strategies for the student support hub so a big thank you to our um to our facilitators and all of you for coming and thank you so much we'll see you at the next one all right thanks everybody